In the late 1960s, a seaside paradise would be hit by a murderous storm. There are at least two or three thousand missing females in the United States, and uh, we don't know how many may be buried in the Truro woods. A series of crimes of unimaginable cruelty. Underneath was a plastic bag with the head in it. It was severed. Committed by a serial killer with a lust for death. He was very proud of what he had done. Very proud of it. What drove these heinous acts? Your first inclination would be this is someone who's psychotic. Was this twisted perpetrator born to kill? In the 1950s and early 60s, the resort of Provincetown, at the tip of New England's Cape Cod, had been a peaceful and old-fashioned harbor town. Provincetown uh, is a relatively small community. It's an artist colony. People fish. It's a scenic, beautiful area. It was uh, lively in the summer. July and August, where we had a lot of tourists. Uh, in the winter time, it was completely dead. <laughs> it was a, a fishing village. It was a place where people knew one another. You could be at the opposite end of town, and if you were doing something wrong, it was such a small community, somebody would yell out, Charlie Sousa, if you put that cigarette in your mouth, I'm calling your father. You know, everybody knew everybody. so. It, it was kind of neat growing up. Uh, you had the run of the town. There wasn't any sense of crime at that time growing up. In the second half of the 1960s, the sleepy fishing town became a magnet to the emerging hippie counterculture. Provincetown has historically been a place where people can go and, if you would, do their own thing. The pilgrims came from England to be able to escape religious persecution. They landed in Provincetown first, um, and Provincetown has always been known for a place where you could kind of do your own thing. Provincetown was a mecca for unusual people and artistic people. The fishermen were very forgiving of a lot of things. One of those to embrace the liberal spirit was 18-year-old local girl, Sydney Monson. She was the type of kid that uh, uh, very free, you know? I mean, she would do things that, uh, on a whim. She was very pretty, long brown hair, and uh, she was just uh, an outgoing type of friendly type of person. But in May of 1968, Sidney Monson suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth. Sidney went out one night and never came back. And everybody was really concerned about what was happening because it was like she just vanished. Some would write Sydney's disappearance off as an innocent sign of the times. This was the era that, you know, free people would take off and not tell their parents where they were going. So it was quite common. People thought, you know, okay, Sydney's doing her thing and, you know, and maybe she met somebody or whatever the case may be. But then as the days rolled on, it, it was out of the ordinary. And Sydney would not be the last to vanish from the Cape Cod community. Eight months later, two young women from Rhode Island disappeared after staying at a guest house in the town. Two girls are reported missing. Mary Ann Wysocki and Pat Walsh. These two girls from Rhode Island uh, were apparently just staying for a weekend, but they never showed up for work. And uh, 
that necessitated the parents reported them missing. One of them was a school teacher, and they had gone to Provincetown just on a, on a lark, on a vacation, then just suddenly disappeared. The parents were so adamant that it was totally out of character for their daughters not to call in. So it wasn't the classic run away from home uh, that you might expect with some of the young, younger children at that time. From Providence, Rhode Island, Patricia Walsh and Marianne Wysocki were both in their 20s and had been friends for years. As investigators looked into their disappearance, a local man's name came into the picture. Some of the people said that they last saw the girls with Tony Costa. He was the last person seen with them, and that's always a good indication that uh, he may have information that's uh, helpful. Detective Bernie Flynn and state trooper Tom Gunnery were assigned the job of tracking down the missing young women. We started at the rooming house where they were registered and all that. And Anton Costa also had a room in this house. Anton Tony Costa was a 24-year-old who'd made something of an impression on the tight-knit fishing community. I remember Tony when I was a kid that he it was always off. He was just a little bit off, very uh, into himself, secluded. He was kind of a loner. He was different. Uh, I do remember him being involved with taxidermy. He used to brag about, he used to go around the streets and pick up roadkill. And uh, a person was telling me the other day, they went on a camping trip and he shot a, shot a raccoon. And he preserved it because he said that he was going to take it home to, uh, to perform taxidermy on it. And he used to drive around at night, you know, rabbits, squirrels, or whatever the case may be, and take them home and, you know, dissect them and do whatever he did to them. So he was always a click off. Costa had a wife, but in recent years, the relationship had broken down, and he'd spent some time in jail for failure to pay child support. He was married, and he, I think he had two children, young children. He was a carpenter, he had, you know, on and off jobs. Uh, he was a handyman, I guess is the classification. Now, Tony Costa had checked out of the guest house where he'd been staying and left town. We searched his room, and uh, in the closet, we found a lot of rope, uh, which had red stains on it. So that, that got us going. We zeroed in on him as a, a suspect. But as the search for the missing girls continued, no one had any idea of the horror that would soon be uncovered. In January 1968, a young teacher, Patricia Walsh, and her friend, Marianne Wysocki, had mysteriously vanished during a trip to the seaside resort of Provincetown on Cape Cod. Witnesses had reported them last being seen with local 24-year-old Tony Costa, a loner with an interest in taxidermy. As police tried to trace the missing girls, a clue to their whereabouts was discovered at an unlikely site, deep in the woods of the neighboring town, Truro. Pine Grove Cemetery. Yeah. Now, would you ever think there'd be a cemetery way out here? The girl's car was seen near the cemetery road. A report had come in that Patricia Walsh's Volkswagen had been sighted parked on a dirt track behind the old cemetery on the day of their disappearance. It brings back a lot of memories. Yeah, I did. The car was seen by a, uh, a resident in the area. And you're going to understand, that's pretty rural. Uh, 
strange people and strange cars are easily recognized. The resident had called the local police chief down to the woods to look at the empty vehicle. When the Volkswagen was first observed by the chief burial, and he ran a, a Signal 10, which was a stolen record, and there was no report of it being stolen. Now, days after the sighting, the car was gone, and there was still no sign of the two young women. The car was seen, but they weren't, of, they weren't seen. The incident with the vehicle rang alarm bells. Although we couldn't be sure uh, for, for certain that there was foul play, given where the car was and then the absence of the car being placed in the woods in Truro, I think we were certain that something was amiss. And yet again, Tony Costa's name came into the picture. He was seen in the car by a number of people and an inquiry Costa had made with a local garage also raised suspicions. Tony had tried to determine what it would cost to have the car painted or repainted. Now the young handyman appeared to have skipped town, an action not out of character. At that time, I believe he was heavy into drugs. And that was the scene back then, the late 60s. And these people, his, his friends, they used to jump on a plane and fly to California, go to New York City. I mean, uh, I mean, it was, it was nothing to, to leave home and take off. But Tony Costa was no run-of-the-mill hippie dropout. The aspiring poet and taxidermist considered himself an intellectual. Tony was very intelligent. His speaking uh, and his uh, mannerism, when he wasn't high on drugs or... You know, he was, uh, he was an intelligent fella. I recall having some conversations with him. If you have a debate with him, he had to be right. You know, the, there was no middle ground with Tony. It was always, he had to be right in regards to no matter what you were you, talking about. That's why he just kept to himself a lot, because a lot of people didn't want to deal with that. However, for some younger women, Tony Costa's good looks and philosophical manner proved seductive. Girls were very much attracted to him because he was. He was extremely handsome. He looked like a porcelain portrait. Young local girl Bonnie Callis encountered Costa when she was working at her father's medical practice. I'd see him as when I came in in the morning or I'd see him when I left for work. He'd be working on the building painting the trim because I remember ducking, not wanting to get painted on. He was always had his eye on, on the females. I was probably 17 years old, 18 years old, and Tony asked my father, who's that chick out there? And it's my daughter, you leave her alone. Don't have anything to do with her. He wasn't the proper type that he wanted his daughter to be dating. In the woods behind the old Truro Cemetery, where the missing girl's car had been sighted, an extensive investigation began. Well, at that time, we were, you know, searching the woods for the two missing girls. We really didn't know what happened to them. We had uh, search teams, national park rangers, uh, local police, uh, a, a lot of state police. We had dogs. We had a, a plane flying over the area. Once we started investigating, it was rather quickly be, you know, until we found something. State Trooper Gunnery's attention was drawn to a suspicious depression on the woodland floor. There was, was indentation about that much. It wasn't completely filled over. It was about 10 feet off the road. I started digging there, and I came across a, a green duffel bag. And underneath the duffel bag, we found these body parts. It was dismembered, pieces. Yeah, yeah. This was the grave that was found. After probing, we found the remains of an unidentified uh, body of a, of a girl. The body had been separated into eight sections. 
and the sexual organs had been removed. But it was neither Patricia Walsh, Marianne Wysocki, or Sidney Monson. It was later identified as Susan Perry. 19-year-old Susan Perry had not been seen for five months. Her family lived in Provincetown. She was a local girl. Uh, and if I remember correctly, Tony might have been going out or dating her during that particular time. Although he had left town, Tony Costa learned he was being connected with the disappearance of Patricia Walsh and her friend Marianne Wysocki, having been spotted in their vehicle. He suddenly returned to Provincetown voluntarily to assert his innocence. We asked him if, uh, when he last saw the girls, and uh, he said that one of the girls ha had to have an abortion and was going to go to Montreal. When he was talking with them, it was like a cat and mouse, because the stories never match. His excuse was the girls gave him the car because they wanted to skip to Canada. But then eventually he said that he bought the car. Investigators were convinced Costa had been involved in foul play and was trying to lead them off the scent. Quite frequently, he, uh, he kept changing his story. He was trying to cover his tracks. In other words, he was trying to outfox the fox. Tony Costa had arrived in Provincetown during the senior year at high school. Although he was known to many of the locals in the small fishing town, he had failed to make deep connections with many of them. I'm a native of Provincetown, but if you came into Provincetown when you were 18 years old, like he was, he could live his whole life here, and they still consider him a wash ashore. He was washed on shore. He's not a native. Now I can picture Tony sitting there right now with his hands together on the desk. He was big, close to six foot, I would think. Uh, muscular, uh, kept to himself, very quiet. He would ride on the school bus, and he was always sat in the back and was always to himself. He never, never got involved with the rest of us. A little weird. It's still somewhat of a mystery to me of why I didn't know him better. Being a small school, I knew the many of the kids that were in freshmen. So he was just a loner. Tony Costa's family were from Provincetown, but he had grown up in the Boston area. His father had been in the Navy, but had drowned on duty. Costa would later be diagnosed as a schizoid personality type. It tends to be people who just really like to stay alone, don't have particular connections with other people. They tend to find jobs where they can work alone. If a person is schizoid, they would tend to not value family relationships or have empathic relationships with friends. They would tend to want to stay on their own and have um, much less interest in the mores of society. But there may have been another reason Tony Costa didn't mix with his contemporaries. It transpired he had left the Boston area under a cloud. Apparently, he used to bring girls to his room, and he used to take pillows and, and put the pillows over their heads and try to smother them. One of the stories that actually came out is that his mother went next door uh, to visit a friend or whatever, and when the mother returned, he had the next door neighbor tied up. Just before arriving in Provincetown, Tony Costa had been caught breaking into the room of a 14-year-old neighbor, fleeing when she awoke. He also admitted that two years earlier, he had bound the same girl with rope and undressed her. It's the early signs of ritualistic behavior that predates a, a murder. When you bind a victim, tie her hands up, you're making it so she is in your control. Those are major red flags for something very, very ominous to occur in the future. I believe he went to court on that. And back in those days, 
I'm talking early 60s, the judge uh, more or less says, you know, you gotta leave town. You gotta get out of town. So they moved to Provincetown. As an 18 year old in his senior year at Provincetown High School, Tony Costa began dating a 13 year old student, marrying her when she was 14. He would be picking her up after school most every day. And she's only in the eighth grade or whatever. So that, that was definitely different. Most of the time when we uh, were dating, it was you dated your class, or probably one at the most two classes below that. That was kind of two years difference was the red line, I guess. A 20-year-old man could control most 14-year-old girls, and that's what he wanted. He wanted someone very, very submissive to him. He didn't want a, a woman with her own mind, her own job, and her own uh, motivation and so on. No, he wanted someone totally under him. As he grew into his 20s, many of Costa's associates remained teenagers. I don't think he could stand himself in an, uh, his own age group because he never hung around with people of his own age, you know. And Costa possessed something that several Provincetown teenagers found alluring. He used, he used pot quite a bit. He grew his own marijuana. Anton Costa had a marijuana garden there and it's not unusual for marijuana uh, plots to be grown in the vast areas here on the Lower Cape. They were pretty free and easy with their drugs, marijuana particularly. Everybody was smoking dope. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that would be enticing to a lot of young people. If he was, if he was growing it, you know, it would be an enticement to get him out there to smoke it. Tony Costa's marijuana garden was in the woods behind the old Truro Cemetery. The area where the missing Rhode Island girl's car had been spotted, and where Provincetown teenager Susan Perry's body had been discovered. Very remote and very quiet. It is a pretty desolate area. If you were to be in there at night, unless someone saw a light flashing, he, it's totally out of, off the beaten path. The investigators were sure that Costa was responsible for the disappearance of Patricia Walsh and Marianne Wysocki. But with no sign of the women, they couldn't prove a crime had taken place. The state police jumped on them and they started working them over, working and working and working the case. We had him under surveillance uh, uh, because he, he was a prime suspect. But then six weeks after the two young women had gone missing, a telegram arrived in Provincetown, addressed to Tony Costa, that pointed to them being alive and well. It read, what happened? We waited as planned. Is everything all right? We'll meet you as schedule, New York City. Love, Pat and Mary Ann. But there was more to the telegram than met the eye. In 1969, the disappearance of Rhode Island teacher Patricia Walsh and her friend Marianne Wysocki had sparked an intense search in the woods of Cape Cod. Detectives were convinced that 24-year-old Tony Costa had something to do with them going missing. However, a telegram addressed to the local man appeared to signal the women were alive and well. Detective Flynn had continually told uh, Mr. Costa that, look, if you didn't do it, if they're okay, just have them contact us. And that went on and on and on. Eventually, a telegram was sent to Tony's mother's home, and she presented it to the police. Police determined that the telegram had been sent from New York. We had another detective went down there to verify the fact, how was the telegram sent? Well, he, Tony Costa, actually sent the telegram to his mother in Provincetown, but it was signed uh, by the two girls from Rhode Island. 
and still more troubling stories had begun to emerge. One of the girls that he had taken down there was apparently shot in the back with an arrow. Uh, he had taken her down there to sh show him his garden. He was out there in his marijuana field with her, and uh, he had a bow and arrow, and shot her in the back with an arrow. I think that girl is very lucky you know, that the arrow didn't penetrate more and really do more harm to her. With fears for the safety of the missing girls, Trooper Gunnery and his fellow investigators focused their efforts on the Truro Woods. We were called out to participate in a search. All we were told was to uh, call the attention of anything unusual to the state police who were on the location. We were searching hard, because we knew this was the area where he, he used to bring girls. We were spaced 25, 30 feet apart, something like that. I came across this huge tree, an area where you'd probably like to lay out a blanket for a picnic. And I saw strands of uh, rope at the base of this tree. I mentioned before, in his closet, in his house, there was a big coil of rope and it had red marks on it. So when I found this tree and I saw pieces of rope around it, I said, I gotta start getting in the ground. So I started uh, digging underneath it and I come across pill vials and all kinds of drug paraphernalia. But underneath that, I sunk my hands into pieces of, the, of, of human flesh. As the search continued, so did the horror. Underneath the drug paraphernalia was a plastic bag with the head in it. It was severed, you know. The trooper's colleague, Detective Flynn, continued the dig. He removed the um, pieces of the body, her head, and cleared her eyes and cleared her mouth. And he said, I recognize this to be the head of Mary Ann Wysocki. I mean, the horror. I mean, God, crazy. Taking the pieces from the woodland grave, it became clear that not all of Mary Ann Wysocki was there. It was like a puzzle. Uh, we were missing parts of that puzzle, uh, and that uh, made us to continue digging. The searchers then uncovered another grave. What they found, they would never forget. It was a very pungent smell. Uh, something that once it got in your nostrils, it stayed there. I can smell it right now as I speak. In the hole, they found the remaining parts of Marianne Wysocki and teacher Patricia Walsh cut in half at the waist. But that was not all. They were about to make another shocking discovery that would solve a 10-month-old mystery. We found another body. Sidney Monson was found uh, in the hole, uh, and the other two girls were on top of her. 18-year-old Sidney Monson had socialized with Tony Costa. Now her dismembered body had been discovered in a grave in the Truro Woods. It crushed me, you know, it's like, uh, um, I just couldn't believe it, you know, because of her, uh, because we had a relationship there for a while and, and, and I just couldn't believe that uh, that would happen to her. She was a real special person to me. The gruesome finds in the woods immediately made national headlines. After the bodies were found, then it became big news. The age of the, of the decomposed bodies uh, may go back beyond six months, eight months, nine months. Uh, we don't know what took place during that time. When word gets out that there is a, a, a crime such as a murder in a small community, um, it's, it's almost like time stops. They were shocked. 
They were truly shocked because they couldn't believe that anybody would be so vicious. To get the attention of the country and probably the world. All evidence pointed to Tony Costa, and he was immediately arrested. There are indications that uh, there are teeth marks on some of these parts of these dismembered bodies. The details revealed at autopsy were sickening. When you see pieces of the body outside, uh, and they're taken out and they're set down and their photographs taken, it looks like pieces of something. But when they're put on a white slab in the, in the mortuary and their bodies are cleaned and you look at their faces, you can see the horror in their face. You can see the scream as they're caught just before death. And you don't forget things like that. You don't forget things like that. I went to every autopsy that there was in Provincetown and seen a lot in my day, but I would have to say that uh, that was the worst, the worst. The dismemberment was evidence of a most twisted mind at work. I mean, you can bury a body much more easily than you can dismembering and burying a body. Dismemberment takes time and a lot of effort and strength and, and tools. So the dismemberment had to be significant to him. It can't just have been utilitarian. You want to own them totally. What better way to own a person than to remove parts of them, hold those parts? What greater intimacy could there possibly be for a killer who wants to continue to commune with the victims after death? I mean, you can imagine the horror out here. N nobody would ever hear you back here. Along with skinning parts of the bodies, in some cases, Tony Costa had attacked or moved the internal organs. He was a taxidermist at one point in his life, and he had an interest in dead things. He had an interest in looking internally at individuals' organs and their insides and taking them out and putting stuffing in and this sort of thing. And he did that sort of mutilation behavior with his victims. He mutilated them terribly. Always remember that someone's occupation follows their personality. Their personality doesn't develop as a result of their occupation. Their personality is there previously. All of that ties together with, with a morbid obsession with death and all that goes along with it. The local Cape Cod community began to recall instances of Costa's strange behavior. He lived in a, in a house in North Pearl on the third floor. And all of a sudden, the, uh, it was becoming known that cats were disappearing. And uh, eventually, it was found out that he was the one that was taking them. And, and uh, I don't know what he did with them, but I'm sure it wasn't pleasant for the cats. But Tony Costa's motives for murder were driven by more than a mere lust for death. One thing for sure, he killed them before he had sex with any of them. As the 24-year-old Provincetown man faced trial, the extreme nature of the crimes drew press from far and wide. There are at least two or 3,000 missing females in the United States, and uh, we don't know how many may be buried in the Truro woods. I think he enjoyed being the, uh, in the spotlight, which he sure was. The trial would mean Costa returning to Cemetery Road and the scene of the crime. I remember coming here with the jury and bringing them here, and this place was, it was like a, a city at the time, with all police vehicles, the coroner's vehicles. The long-lasting impression I got of him was he, he was very proud of what he had done, very proud of it. Costa denied committing the murders, Nevertheless, his attorneys cited his drug use as having dramatically affected his behavior. So his lawyer put that defense into the court that he was insane because of the, the, the drugs. His dependence on pills had supposedly led him to commit burglary at his own doctor's office. He allegedly broke into 
Dr. Callis's office in Wellfleet. And he stole quite a bit of uh, doctor's uh, supplies uh, in drugs. This right here at the corner is the back door to the emergency room, and then the double doors were when the ambulance could back up into it. But it was through the back window here that Tony broke into down this hall. Straight ahead was a locked cabinet. It was maybe about 10 feet long, about three feet wide, and that's where the medications were locked. Large quantities of drugs had been taken, and now Costa's defense team was suggesting they could have twisted his thinking. You can definitely react aggressively under a, a, the influence of a drug. We've had serial killers who've done that. In fact, one turned himself in because his drug use had caused him to kill several people he didn't want to kill. So it can happen. Will anybody who's taking drugs have that reaction? Not at all. But somebody who's already thinking about killing and doing other violations, once they're on drugs, their inhibitions have been evaporated for the most part. His lawyer is trying to find some level of mitigation to understand this. You know, he had a drug problem, he's mentally ill and so on. But uh, his drug abuse had nothing to do with this. If it had any role at all, it was a secondary role in as much as the drug served as a disinhibitor. Um, many of these individuals will have a few drinks, take marijuana or something before they do what they're going to do. The drugs don't cause the behavior, but it just loosens them up and disinhibits them. But Costa's behavior at the trial was at odds with any suggestion that he was a madman. He was disturbed, but he wasn't psychotic. And I think he demonstrated that quite well in court. Cold, cold and arrogant. I never forget him sitting in the prisoner's dock and uh, taking notes. Taking notes. No, no emotion, no nothing. Costa then made a decision he believed would help his cause. He insisted on standing up and making a statement to the court. After the discovery of four mutilated bodies in woods near Provincetown, local resident Tony Costa had been arrested and was facing trial. His defense team had suggested that Costa's behavior had been altered by his use of drugs. The defendant then took the decision to address the court with a personal statement. First of all, they believe they can charm the jury. Secondly, they want to keep control. And third, if they're narcissistic, they don't think that anybody can speak for them as well as they can speak for themselves or defend them as well as they can defend themselves. So they believe that by testifying, they keep control over how they are perceived and what their legacy is going to be and how the proceedings will go, and they are completely wrong about that, but within their narcissistic frame, they can't see beyond themselves. He gave a dissertation on the evil of drugs. That was as good as you wanted to hear anywhere. But when he finished, Lieutenant Killen moved over to me and whispered, now it's going to be hard to prove that he's nuts. That's just what exactly what Killen said to me because it, it showed that he, had, he was very rational, very, very, uh, was articulate. Um, and I suspect that if I were defending him, uh, I may not have wanted him to make the statement. Nevertheless, the way the women in the woods had been treated seemingly pointed to the work of someone insane. When you look at Costa's crime scene behavior, the taking someone's heart and putting it where the genitals should be and the total mutilation of the body, when you look at that, your first inclination would be this is someone who's psychotic. Um, but he's not psychotic. Uh, he was abnormal, there's no question about that, but very doubtful if he was hearing voices or had delusions and this sort of thing. But he was very, very troubled. If you look at Costa's behavior, it indicates an individual whose fantasy life was very, very primitive. It was very, very regressive. I was horrified by some of the gory details. 
and so were the jurors. Everybody was, except Tony. Tony Costa's people objected to the introduction of the photographs with the mutilated bodies. And, uh, but he was eager to look at the photographs and see his own handiwork. He just, this, this was part of him, part of the coldness, the soullessness of this man that he could revel in, in, in reliving the experience. Ultimately, the jury decided that Tony Costa knew exactly what he was doing when he murdered and mutilated the four young women found in the woods. And it's believed, but not proven, that he was responsible for several more murders. But what had made him capable of committing such atrocities? Was Tony Costa a born killer? It's hard for me to want to believe that people are born to kill. The fact is some people are predators uh, and do kill. I think Tony was a, uh, he was a sick person, um, but I also believe he knew the difference between right and wrong. The bottom line would be, yes, the drugs would affect his personality, his actions, but I still think somewhere in his mental capacity, uh, you would have to have that in his, in his brain of murder and torture or whatever. I mean, what he did to these girls, I mean, he didn't just shoot them and bury them. I mean, he dismembered them. I mean, terrible. There had to be something in his head that, that, that made him do these things. Psychotic, no. Um, I don't think he was out of touch with reality, uh, but he was certainly very, very disturbed. I don't think Tony Costa was born to kill, but there was a number of factors uh, in his life here, his interest in death and all that surrounds death in a very, very morbid and perverse way. Um, could have remained in his fantasies his entire life, but it didn't in this case. In his case, he acted it out. Was he predestined to do this? I don't think so, um, but he definitely did do it. Um, was there a strong neurobiological component with respect to what arouses him sexually? I, I would say yes. Uh, most people who have that type of uh, abnormality contain it and never act out, but Costa did act out. He was the epitome of evil, soulless, no empathy, no sympathy, no compassion. And uh, I'd never seen anybody like that before. He was like an automaton. He was just a, just a walking weirdo. And as I say, just inordinately evil. <laughs>